Hello, hello, hello. How are you? It is your good friend Sean Ferrick back again so soon after the last episode of Ups and Downs because I am delighted to say Star Trek Prodigy has returned to our screens. Yes, season 1B has begun with episode 11, Asylum. As you know, last time around when we were doing the Ups and Downs for Prodigy, unfortunately, due to boring YouTube reasons, we were not able to continue for the whole season. So what we need is you Yes, you. We need you to like, to share these videos and to subscribe because we need to know that you want to consume this content and we want to make it for you. But to do that, we need you to give us a little bit of a dig out there when it comes to getting the views up. We love you all. We appreciate you all. And with that, shall we have a look at the ups and downs? It was also very nice as well, I must say, to see that both Jimmy Simpson and John Noble are still in those opening credits. One would be forgiven by the close of the last episode for thinking, hmm, well, we've seen all we're going to see from them. Now, as we know, for John Noble in particular, that is not the case. Up! A ship that looks very like Spock's jellyfish ship from the 2009 Kelvin movie. The reason that... I'm giving this a note. First of all, it's because I think it's a fun little design and I'm glad that it hasn't just been relegated to that one film, but also it works. Remember, Spock's jellyfish came from the Prime Universe. He went back through the black hole in that ship. So for that, you know, that's not just a Kelvinverse ship. That is, in fact, that's a prime universe starship and including it in Star Trek Prodigy like this. Now, it's a little bit different, but you can see that it is clearly inspired by does that little bit of a tie-in between the Kelvin Universe movies and Star Trek Prodigy. So I really, really enjoyed that. I like as well that it's a multi-pilot ship because, of course, we've got Jankum Pog, we've got Gwyn, and we've got Dal are all in there. Very much enjoying seeing them all back again. I just really like these characters. Watching it cut through water seems like a very deliberate attention to detail. Jellyfish. Where did jellyfish live? Generally, they live in water. Jellyfish ship, water. You see where we're going with this. Very, like, I was just, it was just lovely to see it, and it deserved an up all on its own. Jankum Pog, I said this in previous episodes, that I, I was a little bit concerned that Jankum Pog would be just deliver a punchline and we'd get fed up with him after a little while because, like, where's the character there? So you're going to find the fact that I'm giving an up to one of his one-liners this week maybe a little bit of a... Sean, do you listen to yourself when you talk? When you look at this, it's when they're in the belly of the whale and Jankum Pog is hung upside down like everyone else, just being like, oh, I swore I'd never get eaten alive. Again, just the delivery of again. Jason Manzugas absolutely smashes it because it's just genuine belly laugh out of me, which I, lo I love just smiling during this show but particularly that scene really worked for me i mean it's also quite a serious scene they're they're trying to build up their good deeds so that when they finally do meet starfleet they'll have so many you know gold stars beside their names that starfleet will hopefully just overlook the whole fact of you know stolen ship at least they're being honest about it but hologram janeway is giving them all of these missions in an attempt to build us up. It's been six weeks since the events of Tars Lamora, and who says that you can't do good deeds without being really bloody funny? So for me, Jank and Pog there delivering that one-liner. Yep. While their jellyfish ship is inside the belly of the whale, there is quite an astounding scene. And what it is, is that the whale is being obviously hunted by these effectively mer people. Uh, you could call them versions of the Zindi Aquatics as well, if you like. It's Flying along, Zero comes in to save the day and is going to beam the whale up. But if you look at that shot before the whale is completed its transport, where the shadow of the protostar is flying above the surface of the ocean, of course, we know what it is. It's just oh, up. It looked amazing. I love the fact that they beamed it in like that. And then they get away just before there's a prime directive violation because these aquatic hunters, they don't know about the existence of, well, life outside the ocean. This whale must be saved. They must bring it to safer waters, but they can't really destroy their 
the, the aquatics version of what reality is. So yeah, it all works for me. It's a strong evocation um, of the opening of Star Trek Into Darkness. Now, the details, of course, are different. We've got fire, we've got water and everything. But again, just this idea of what the protostar did a little bit better than Captain Kirk, it must be said, is that they managed to get away without being seen. This, of course, then leads to quite a funny situation where, you know, there's a whale sitting on the deck of the protostar. Because of course there is. Is it suffocating right there? That's not really addressed, but they do beam it back into another area of the ocean, directly in front of another space whale. So actually, do you know what? You gotta keep the existence of life outside the ocean secret from the aquatic hunters, but it's absolutely fine to beam a whale right in front of another whale? Seems like there's some sentience assumptions going on there. Hmm. These events lead to the arrival at CR721, which is one of the Federation's furthest comm relay stations away from Federation territory, which is why the Protostar is able to rock up to it, you know, long before ever encountering another starship. There is this moment on the protostar that really it really struck a chord with me everyone is getting dressed into their you know their protostar uniforms but particularly hologram janeway is there making sure that dal looks the part she reminds him despite all of his nerves and despite his fears of what starfleet might think of him she says you have to take a leap of faith and he hugs her that's an up that is that is an up because dal has gone through the biggest character arc of the show so far. Um, I made no secret of the fact that I really struggled with Dal in the initial few episodes of season one because I just thought there was quip for the sake of quip. Obviously, it would become a symptom of his both confidence and lack thereof, but here, there's no chaff. He is a, an adolescent who is nervous about the future and when someone gives him a little bit of encouragement, he responds by throwing his arms around them. And as Janeway says, I mean, this must be a first for a hologram. It isn't. Many holograms have had hugs before, but it's a first for Dal. And this scene really, it works. It works very, very well. I thought it was great to include it in the episode. Not as a, you know, oh, you know, we know you didn't like Dal last year, let's, let's like him more. No, it works. It works in the context of the episode. So that was a very lovely moment. Now, the protostar comes alongside the relay station and extends the, extends the docking, uh, the docking port. It's like a holographic one. We love it. They cross over and they enter the station and they are greeted by Barnus Frex, a Denobulan who, uh, quite frankly, he might be on the outs with Starfleet because he is the only member of the crew of this entire station. Did you upset an admiral? He is quite welcoming and even when the kids are quite open about the fact that, okay, here's, here's the sitch. We accidentally stole a ship. We kind of want asylum. We're returning the ship. Um, Soz, as kids probably would do. You're honest, so I'll give you that. And actually, he's really very welcoming initially. What I will do is I do want to give an up to Eric Baza, who plays Frex in this episode. I actually thought he was good fun. I loved his delivery. In one of the earlier trailers, I actually mistook him for Jason Alexander, who will appear at the end of this episode. I got their characters mixed up. I'm only human. But yes, I really enjoyed his performance in this episode. Um, didn't enjoy some of the things the character did, but we'll get to that. We'll get to that now in a moment. They start to scan all of the 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 very the, the kids, right? So Jankum gets scanned, and you know, as Frex would of course recognize, going, "Oh, you're a Tellerite. Yeah, welcome. You're one of the founding members of the Federation." Of course, Jankum straight away is like, "Rock Talk is scanned," and of course, she's a Breakar, and. Frex again recognizes her. There might somewhere be a little beta cannon alert going off because the Breakar are of course from beta cannon before Star Trek Prodigy. And it's really, it's really quite cute to see this acknowledgement of like, oh yes, the Breakar are very real. Huh? Do you want to grow up to be a rock star? I did think it was a little bit of a simple joke, but we do like the answer that no, she wants to be a scientist, as we know. And Frex, instead of being like, ha, 
yeah, no, but you're a recar. It's like, oh, sweet, okay, cool. What kind of science do you want to learn? And, you know, it works. I like it. Then, Murph gets scanned. We discover Murph's species. Murph is in fact, hold on. Oh, oh, hang on. Oh, I'm getting a call from Canon, watch. Hello, this is Sean Blast with Galaxy Truth Network, the only network that will tell you the real goings on. It's finally revealed this week what Murph is, and he is in fact a melanoid slime worm. What are melanoid slime worms? What they are is a vilified race. They, like many of the others, have been blamed once again and once again and once again for various acts, and they are used as an insult against fine, upstanding truthers. So we find out that this wonderful little Murph has been given this horrible, denigrating title, and he's just one other victim of the soulless minions of orthodoxy. Back to you, Sean. Um, thanks, Sean. Uh, hope that new channel goes well. We then cut, rather surprisingly, to the launch of the USS Protostar. Now, I wasn't expecting that in this episode, nor was I expecting this character to appear so early, and Robert Beltran is back as Chakotay. We knew he was going to be in this season, but I actually wasn't expecting him to be here this early. Now, it's a, a holographic recording of the launch of the Protostar, which explains how we just suddenly jumped back in time. It's lovely to see his interaction with Admiral Janeway, and, you know, they sort of... They, they dance around the, the ranks, and we have Captain Chakotay, of course, and he calls her Captain Janeway. Oh, no, sorry, Vice Admiral Janeway. And it's just a lovely scene between two old friends. And, of course, this is modern-day Vice Admiral Janeway watching this recording. In the recording, she says to Chakotay that if you get in trouble, please call. And he says he will. Pause program, modern-day Janeway says, but why didn't you call? And this, of course, is the mystery. Where is Chakotay? What happened to the crew of the Protostar? And that, of course, has been the, the mystery for a little bit of the last bit of the last season, or the first part of this season. And it's going to be dialed up now that the Dauntless has arrived in the Delta Quadrant. We see the Dauntless, in fact, arrive at Tars Lamora in this episode with Janeway and her crew walking through. And although this does skip a little bit to the end of the episode, they find this, the body in stasis of the Diviner. Now, this cannot be good. This cannot be good at all, because what do we know about the Diviner? He has rigged the Protostar to be this great booby trap against Starfleet. But, I mean, put the Diviner himself on a Starfleet vessel, and I'm a little bit concerned. I will, however, say... Yay! More John Noble! Now, but an example of his plan in motion sees the Bar Barnas Frex tries to download the ship's logs from the Protostar onto the Com Relay station and up the station. It's a little bit intimidating. It starts to go haywire. I mean, these phaser strips just dip out and they start to destroy itself. Basically, it self-destructs with more steps. And it's, it's really quite like, oh dear to watch because we have Zero is trying to help Gwyn get her memories back. They're using the more advanced sickbay on board the station and she's trapped in there and it's, yeah, it, it looks a bit ropey for a while, um, but it does lead me to a down and this down is for the actions of Barnas Frex. We quite liked him in his performance. It's nice to see Denobial in it. It's, you know, lovely to see this character. And yet, when the station is beginning to rip itself apart, and yes, please don't get me wrong, I do understand that from his point of view, these strangers who turned up, they set this virus on board. They are responsible for the actions. Now, obviously, we know they're not, sort of. But what he then does next is unforgivable. Trellium down. <laughs> Barnas Frex, a Starfleet officer, abandons a bunch of children to explode on that comm station. Now, I watched that and I went, really? He then escapes on the only escape pod that this comm station has to offer. It's bad. 
it is bad. He flies away. I did think that there is a there there is a, a good scene where, of course, they're in the thing, and a bit like Chekhov's gun, there was all of these flight suits just sitting there ready to be worn. So I mean, clearly, it's like, well, they have to get off the station. They're going to do a spacewalk. So that was fine with me. So I did think that maybe it was setting it up for, oh well, he'll rescue them in space. But no, he's gone. He leaves the episode at this point, which was surprising. I have to say that was that was a shock. It was an unpleasant shock. I do have another little down in this scene and I get why it's in the episode. There is an exchange between Dal and Zero where they joke about the fact, or well, they, they sort of jibe about the fact that there's no sound in space. The Paramount executives way back in 1966 were the ones responsible for, you know, that no sound in space being a thing. You know, they, you know, they said, look, it would be it would be boring to watch the Enterprise firing phasers and you can't hear anything. And so, you know, we're just going to make sure there's sound in space and that's it. So Star Trek has been, for all of its versions of reality, Star Trek has actually always had sound in space, which of course is wrong. So they do make a joke out of that and then immediately walk outside and there's loads of sound in space. And I thought, I get why you're putting it in there, but then you're just kind of shining a light on why it's wrong. And call me a stick in the mud for me, that was a down. Sorry. But what I did really enjoy is when Rock Talk sciences their way out of there and you see all that math coming down over the screen. Reminded me straight away of that internet meme of the woman trying to figure out something, some math coming in all around her and that scene from The Hunger, or uh, The Hangover as well. I thought that was really funny. That was an up for me, I have to say. Rock Talk does get them into the path of the tractor beam for the protostar then we get the reveal that gwen does remember everything which leads into that aforementioned scene with the dauntless and the diviner so that's everything in that part of the episode so come and take a walk with me to cetacean observations <laughs> The Spock's jellyfish, as already mentioned, we have as well the shot of the protostar that was beaming the whale inside. Come on, Admiral There Be Whales here. That absolutely must be a reference to Star Trek IV The Voyage Home. We get a reference to the Gamma Quadrant. We get a reference to Nimbus 3. That's an up. Sorry, Nimbus 3, reference to the greatest Star Trek film of them all. Absolutely had to up that one. We get a reference to the Tellarites being founding members of the Federation. To, uh, reference to the Bree car. Well, I'll be a Horta's uncle. Loved it. A melanoid slime worm. That was introduced in the episode Coming of Age in Star Trek The Next Generation. When Wesley Crusher is going to do one of his first Starfleet Academy exams, he bumps into a Zaldan in the corridor. The Zaldans are infuriated by courtesy and in fact he accuses Wesley of being a melanoid slime worm and that's where this originally comes from it's quite it's quite the insult quite the insult we also get the references of course to Medusans going mad when you see their true form a Sakari is one of the proposed species that Dal is. Now the Sakari were introduced in the Star Trek Voyager episode Blood Fever. Theirs was a race that had almost been completely wiped out by the Borg. They had, they lived in the Necrot Expanse and they had learned to actually camouflage themselves very, very well. We get references to Talaxians as well. And of course the various, welcome to the final frontier jokes, which I thought was very, very funny. The launch of the Protostar itself, I think was quite deliberately a nod to the launch of the Enterprise B in Star Trek Generations with the champagne bottle smashing against it. We get the escape pod that leaves the comm station is very, very evocative of the escape pods aboard the Enterprise E, which of course we saw in Star Trek First Contact. And although the space whale was an ocean whale, the fact that Hologram Janeway calls it a space whale, for me, she's talking about a gormagander. That is everything for our list this week. What did you think of the episode? Did it bring you onto the whole love that is Star Trek Prodigy? Or do you still need maybe a little bit more to be sold on it? Let us know in the comments below. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Now I really can't stress that enough, particularly for a new series like this. You can get in touch with us over on Twitter at Trek Culture and Instagram at Trek Culture YT. You can contact myself at Sean Ferrick on Twitter or at Sean.Ferrick88 on Instagram. And of course you can contact the wonderful Chris at Edit Chris Ed Edit on Twitter as well. Everyone, look after yourselves till I see you again. Two ups and downs this week. How lucky are we? Live long and prosper until we're chatting again. Our friends in Ukraine, stay strong. Our friends in Iran, you inspire us. Everyone, 
Have a wonderful, wonderful week. Make it so.